Hi there. One of the uh, main tenets of Gnosticism is that, um, as you know, this matter is evil, inherently evil, uh, inherently blind, inherently without conscience, uh, inherently ignorant, uh, in that it just acts in a mechanical in a mechanical way, or even if it is synchronistic way, um, by some sort of governed by some kind of cosmic algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is is impersonal and unfeeling uh, and takes nothing into account. It's harsh, judgmental, uh, inevitable. I suppose the judgment of inevitability. <clears throat> and we see here that <clears throat> also there there is a there's a factor infinite and unknown, which is which I call happenstance, uh, which I suppose is randomness, really, um, in the sense of randomness, chaos. Although I, I understand that chaos and randomness are different things, but <clears throat> in my sort of nomenclature, they, they kind of lump together. But in also, but in this also this causality, um, <clears throat> and uh, which I also call drift. Uh, or tendency, so it's a tendency for certain things to happen, even though they appear to be random, um, because there are causal factors, multiple causal factors involved. Um, so, as far as we're concerned, uh, there is the, there is such a thing called accident, um, accident, anxiety, um, pain, um, mortality, or sense of mortality. Um, a sense of threat, uh, long term or short term or imminent, um, and uh, of course scarcity being the, the big thing, scarcity of energy, scarcity of resources. Um, and I might also put in here um, poor distribution of resources as well, or unfair distribution of resources. Um, but also people, people are just in the right place at the right time, so happenstance comes into in, into the distribution resources and the resources that are available in a, any one given location. Uh, so given this, uh, what might call sorry state of affairs, um, but I mean, I put that in quotation marks because as far as the impersonal algorithm of the universe is concerned, it is neither sorry nor, nor, nor the opposite of sorry, nor glad. Uh, it just is what it is. It is as it is. Nevertheless, uh, of course, we react emotionally. Um, we it, it, or the situation creates various reactions: spectrum of reactions, spectrum of fear, uh, greed, uh, aggression, uh, and um, selfishness, and, and things like that. Uh, a sense of survival kicks in as well, um, and uh, these things can hardly either be called good or bad. Really, they are just arising in that sense. Um, and of course we act, uh, or we don't act. The sins of omission and the sins of commission, as the Jesuits like to put it. Um, but at any rate, whatever we do, whatever contradictions we get ourselves into, uh, intellectual, mental contradictions, um, ironies of life, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, of course, it all cre all this uh, create all this drama. Uh, all this action, all this reaction creates psychic energy. And it is upon that psychic energy uh, that the Demiurge and his agents and the demons feed. Um, and uh, they feed uh, because they have to, uh, because they're governed by scarcity, accident, uh, habits to hunts, etc, etc. Uh, so they're locked into the same uh, world. Um, and it is a curious thing as to whether the demiurge is a cause or effect. Uh, it could be that uh, there's a part of the demiurge which is the first cause of all this, um, but it also then becomes an effect, so he becomes a, a victim of his own devices, as it were, the same as, as we are, uh, a victim of our own devices in many, in many instances. So um, anyway, so of course, the, feeds off the psychic energy and this feeding um, creates a sort of loop a loop back mechanism which creates more accident more happenstance more scarcity 
uh, which then creates more um, reaction and action, which then creates more psychic energy. So uh, for the demiurge, it's, it's a virtuous cycle. Uh, and for the people that are being fed on, or the sentient beings that are being fed on, it is a vicious cycle, uh, which, which is as it is as well. Um, and you might say, well, you know, what are you complaining about? It is what it is. You say that on one hand, but then you complain on the other, and you talk about matter being evil. Um, well, okay, matter is evil. Let us say matter is A, uh, but transcendence is B, if you like. If you don't want to call them good or evil, call them one state, A state, and B state. <laughs> um, but we don't want to be remain in A state, or at least well, the soul doesn't want to remain in A state. Uh, it wants to go to the B state, uh, ultimately, uh, and indeed perhaps it already is going there inevitably. Um, so that all that remains basically is to is to take the experiences that you had when you were soul in this in this particular uh, lower world state, um, and take and take those experiences as understanding as wisdom uh, into the transcendental state. So that's a kind of the general theory, um, and but of course in contradiction to this, and I have to say. Um, some of the, what might be called negativities, negative aspects of existence, can also uh, stimulate uh, a positive response. They can stimulate um, a Gnostic experience. Um, they can also uh, stimulate um, altruism, kindness, compassion uh, and love. Uh, all the things that are qualities which are to be found in, in abundance in the transcendental world uh, and are scarce in, in this world. Nevertheless, you know, adversity can actually stimulate people to do good things um, and stimulate people to do selfish, thoughtless things at the same time. Uh, and sometimes the same people do thoughtless, selfish things and altruistic, kind things as well. Obviously, we are all sinners, mea culpa kind of thing. Um, but as far as the Gnostic experience goes, uh, you know, it's possible that adversity uh, can stimulate the Gnostic experience. For example, Stefan Heuler talks about uh, when, when, they were, when they were in his Hungary uh, under the Germans um, and everything was very uncertain and dangerous and threatening and, 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 and very harsh. Uh, and they went skiing. He went skiing with his mother, um, and they and Stefan heard these bells, um, but it wasn't church bells. It was just bells coming from the mountains, you know, uh, and the trees. And um, he heard them very distinctly. Um, and he told his mother about this, and and she said, well, perhaps it's you know, it's it, well. He told his mother that uh, it perhaps this was a sign that that all would be well ultimately. Um, even though they had to go through terrible experiences. And of course, then the family moved to to eastern part of, of Austria, which for a time was under the Soviet uh, occupation. Uh, and of course, obviously, the Soviets, um, the Russians hated the Germans. Anybody who spoke German was obviously to be treated badly. Um, and then in any case, you know, after the war, ever, the economies were wrecked and, and there's terrible rationing, well, there's food shortages. Uh, unbelievable, st you know, food. Um, there was actual starvation. Uh, there was no money. There was no, there was, there was no coal. There was no, you know, it was nothing, nothing really, nothing left after the Second World War, uh, especially in Austria. Um, and um, plus the Soviets, um, you had to deal with them at the same time. Um, and uh, but but in the midst of this, uh, you know. Um, Stefan remembered these bells that he heard in his native country um, that uh, that sort of helped him. I mean, he remembered the experience and this experience sort of kept him going uh, through all the terrible uh, years after the Second World War uh, and, and under Soviet occupation, of course, with Hungary um, and under the, the Stalinists. So, um, you know, uh, and it well, and it as it turned out, his life uh, did turn out and amazing. You know, he had a calling. Uh, the bells were calling him, and he's, he's still going. Uh, he's done preaching, uh, preaching Gnosticism, you know, for decades now in in California, uh, Los Angeles, and um, 
you know, he, he, the, his, his, he's got a bit, you know, a large following of people and, and people help him and people translate his texts and publish his books. And, you know, obviously there have been challenges throughout his life, but he's had a long life uh, and he's had a life dedicated to evangel the evangelical uh, ministry uh, of, of uh, telling people about the good news of, of the Gnostic um of, the, of Gnostic Christianity. So, uh, you know, uh, so in the midst of adversity, sometimes, you know, we can have a Gnostic experience uh, and then remember that experience uh, throughout the following years of adversity. Um, and they do speak of a change of circumstances uh, and a circumstance, well, they also speak of a calling. They speak of, of the fact that you are, you have been spared. Um, for a purpose, um, and that purpose is to bring the good news uh, to to as many people as you possibly can. Um, so we have depression. I mean, obviously, there was great depression after the Second World War, as you can imagine. Uh, there was depression for decades after uh, living under the Soviets, um, uh, and some people did commit suicide because they just couldn't stand uh, the terrible conditions they lived under, uh, which Stefan also uh, talks about. He, Many people that his family knew committed suicide because um, his family, of course, were, were aristocrats. And of course, so they were uh, obviously um, treated badly uh, by the Soviet inspired government um, of Hungary. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, there's depression. I mean, I've, I've suffered depression, obviously, for a long, many years. Um, and, but in the midst of that depression, when you're feeling that at, the, at your lowest, uh, sometimes experiences happen and I mean sometimes you can feel the action of the Holy Spirit coming into your life um, and changing things either dramatically or very very subtly uh, very small incremental changes uh, but things that are miraculous little mir miracles happen along the way um, and, and some of the choices that you make you think you've made the wrong choice which turn out to be the right choice as well uh, and that seems kind of miraculous as well when you look back on that. So, um, you know, there's, in the midst of depression, uh, it's not a panacea for depression, but in the midst of depression, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. There's no doubt about that. Um, so then I come down here to the opposite, which is elation and comfort. Um, you know, I'm not saying you should seek out depression and seek out adversity and, and you know, where, you know, and... and be, become a, an ascetic living in the desert uh, because no doubt if you're sitting comfortably in a nice uh, armchair by the fire uh, sometimes you can definitely have the Gnostic experience uh, arising out of that nice comfort uh, and you've got a full belly and, and, and you're doing your breathing exercises and you're peaceful and calm and everything's going okay in your life and, and sometimes you know um, you can be given more than just comfort. You can be given a Gnostic experience. Um, and, uh, but also, uh, I suppose, elation as well. Um, one thinks of the, of the whirling dervishes, uh, uh, you know, that do their whirling and they become elated. Uh, and sometimes a Gnostic experience can arise from that. So it's not like uh, either adversity, discomfort, depression, uh, and you should choose that over comfort and elation. Uh, you, you know, you shouldn't do. Um, you know, they're all they're both equally valid conditions uh, that gnosis may occur. And I say may because obviously, you know, you can't direct the energy. You can't. You can't uh, summon Jesus. You can't summon the Holy Spirit like they were the jinn or something like that. You know, that's not on the, the agenda. Um, this is an interesting thing, ugliness um, and prejudice. I mean, we all have prejudice. Uh, we all perceive ugly, ugliness. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can perhaps uh, go into a state of mind which rejects uh, the perception of ugliness um, and rejects the prejudice uh, that creates this uh, judgment of ugly uh, in your heart. Um, um, and you sort of go into a state where that state of mind of acceptance and forgiveness and non-prejudice uh, that opens your heart to a Gnostic experience. So that, again, that creates the conditions 
um, that, are, that, could be, that could result in a Gnostic experience. And then finally, of course, beauty. Uh, there's no doubt about it that sitting in a beautiful forest, um, you know, or, or under a tree or something like or a nice parkland uh, is, can be very, um, can prepare the way. Um, and, and also, of course, in, cult, in cultured uh, uh, beauty. Of course, beauty uh, is a cultural construct. Uh, so sometimes you can also challenge uh, the basis of, of what you assume to be beautiful as well, because you know it's a cultural con uh, construct, and you can sometimes deconstruct uh, the idea of beauty uh, and perhaps not see beautiful nature everywhere and not be influenced by the 19th century romantics. Um, uh, and and you, may, uh, you may, in your mind, go against that whole 19th century obsession with natural beauty. Um, and that uh, in itself, uh, that sort of contemplation, uh, could very often prepare, prepare you uh, for the Gnostic experience. Um, and I say prepare because there's a difference between being prepared uh, and sort of purified, uh, uh, then the difference between that uh, and directing uh, and, and summoning, uh, like a magician, there's a great difference. I, I don't, people may say I'm splitting hairs, that what, what's the difference between, you know, um, thinking that you've caused something to happen uh, or you're prepared for something to happen? I think there's a big difference. I mean, you, you, you know, you're prepared for something to happen but you're not uh, wishing it to happen. You're not wishing it not to happen. Um, it, you know, it may happen or it may not, but if it does, you're prepared for it. You know, again, you know, you, you've, you've, you've kept your lamps clean uh, for the return of the king. Um, and I think that's very different from trying to cause something to happen with your will or your, you know, with some kind of spirit or magical power or something ridiculous like that. Not to say there aren't magical powers, of course there are, um, and healing can be a magical power. It can be what they call in Hinduism a siddha or magical, a magical attribute. Uh, but again, even there in healing, you're not trying to cause something. You're almost trying to prepare uh, the healy um, for, the, for the experience of the miraculous, uh, which again is different from causing something. Uh, but perhaps you don't agree with that. Perhaps you think I'm just splitting hairs. I don't know. Um, so the the upshot of all this is that, you know, <laughs> it's it's almost like uh, I suppose we have a choice, don't we? We can either choose uh, to give psychic energy to the demiurge, uh, or we can take the psychic energy of our experiences uh, of adversity and depression, ugliness, beauty, prejudice. Um, enculturation, uh, comfort and, uh, and elation. We can take these experiences and actually they become the energy, well not the energy to cause something to happen, but let us say they are the energy of the lamp uh, which is being kept clean uh, and the wick has been kept clean um, and, and perhaps even lit, set alight. Um, and there's a light being created and perhaps attracting uh, more light to come to it, um, but not in a causal way, but just, uh, just being there um, so that the Holy Spirit can also be there with you, if you see what I mean. Um, and this all takes place in, evil, in the midst of evil matter. Um, and so it brings into question the fact that, you know, because we, we, you know, we don't have to be evil along with the evil matter. We can choose to be transcendent, uh, even in the midst of, of the of the nadir uh, of psychic energy, or or the or the in the midst of evil, uh, evil matter, which could cause us uh, to not have it to block out the Holy Spirit. I mean, I would say that whilst you can't cause the Holy Spirit to come to you. Uh, you can certainly prevent it uh, from coming to you uh, in this world. Um, you can certainly, the negative is stronger than the positive in that sense. Uh, so you can actually set up a field where the, where the Holy Spirit can't penetrate you uh, because you're so full of darkness, um, or so full of rejection, and you've hardened your heart against Christ and, and Holy Spirit. 
to such an extent it, that they cannot penetrate uh, because they'd have to use force and they're not going to use force. You've got, you know, um, so it's possible that, you know, that you could choose to do that uh, and also then choose uh, to react negatively to negativity, thus creating negative psychic energy, which feeds the demiurge. Um, or you can choose um, to open yourself uh, to the Holy Spirit and to the miraculous and to the transcendence instead. Um, it is up to you. It is probably up to all the sentient beings and all the non-localized beings of the, of the universe and of the multiverse, uh, right up to the demiurge. Perhaps the demiurge could also choose um, to open to the transcendent uh, instead of feeding off people's psychic energy. But I doubt that's ever going to happen. Uh, but in theory, it, it, it could happen. Um, and some people can say uh, that the magician can even bring certain evil spirits into the light um, and, and make, oh, well, not make, well, that's induce uh, those spirits to be open to the Holy Spirit. Uh, despite the fact that they've been, you know, uh, evil uh, and vampiric for, for millions and millions of years, that they, 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 still, they, they too can change. Um, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't never pres presume to be a magician that could be pa as powerful to do that, um, quite honestly. Um, and I have to say again that Jesus, uh, well, he, he tended to kick the demons out. <laughs> places, uh, not give them a group hug, you know what I mean? Um, and he was a master magician, so if he didn't think he could bring them to the light, I don't know, I don't know if I can. <laughs> um, perhaps you can, because you're, you're a Ipsissimus or something like that, and, and you really can do that. Um, good luck to you if you can. Uh, I, I would stay away from all that kind of thing if, if I wouldn't, you know, you, you can love the demons, but I wouldn't wouldn't turn your back on them for one second. Do you know what I mean? Um, but that's that's probably me being literal, literalistic again, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, don't be literalistic, they say to me. Uh, it's all just psychological and symbolic. Um, okay, uh, if you want to believe that, uh, you can. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to get at you for believing that. Um, um, but but um, but I don't know if I want to go that far <laughs> uh, away from the reality of the demons. To be perfectly honest. Um, having said that, of course, you know as I said before, this very conversation about psychic energy and things feeding off you and all that—that that is itself creates psychic energy on which the demons feed. So really, you know, you sh well, I shouldn't and you shouldn't go on think about this too much. Uh, you know, and, and, a lot, and maybe this video should even be a private video uh, because you don't want people thinking about this uh, over much or even at all, really, um, because some people are very prone to paranoia. Um, and if you talk about vampires sucking energy off people, they're going to go crazy. You know, they're going to put garlic on their doors and uh, I don't know, and, and do lots of superstitious, ru rubbishy, gobbledygooky things and maybe even vicious things. Uh, on the basis that they're trying to escape the evil eye or trying to escape. You can't escape the evil eye. This is, this is the world as it is, you know. You, 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 know, you, can't rub, you know, you can't rub the lucky Buddha or throw salt over your left, left shoulder. Um, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it never has and it never will. Um, there is a transcendental quality uh, which is present in the midst of all this, of all this sorry state, um, which reflects the transcendental uh, realm itself, uh, where none of this duality exists. Uh, and that's basically all you can say. And all you can say then is, let's get in touch, touch with that transcendental quality within ourselves, uh, which reflects the transcendental realm, rather than trying to, I don't know, defend ourselves from the evil eye or the demiurge or his vampiric agents or blah 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 uh you know it, it's no good thinking about all that um you know the, you know don't don't build an astral fortress around yourself um it does no good having said that um there's no doubt the seven cleansing breaths are a good thing to do uh so i'd recommend doing that but building an uh, you know an astral fortress on your building 
circles on your floor and I don't know and, and garlic and crucifixes and I, all the all the Dennis Wheatley stuff uh, it's absolute rubbish uh, and don't go down that uh, route uh, because you'll, you'll just become as insane as a demiurge himself ultimately um, which will please a demiurge no end uh, but won't do you much uh, much uh, ha uh, much good um, so uh, okay so that's basically what I wanted to say on the on the subject of of preparing yourself for a Gnostic experience um, and uh, as I say you can only prepare yourself uh, and prepare others and tell others the good news that Gnosis is possible you can't what you can't do is summon Gnosis and what you can't do is make other people into Gnostics just isn't going to work and you're just going to do more harm than good if you try um, so with that uh, warning attached to the end of this video um, I wish you all the best of luck um, in your in your spiritual journey uh, towards being a true reflection uh, of, of, of the underlying truth of the reality of God.